And we're live. It's my pleasure to welcome Karen, VP of Customer and Market Insights at Salesforce to this week's episode of CX Sales to learn about Salesforce's approach to CX, the role of tech in B2B CX, and the role of a purpose statement. Karen, do you want to give a quick intro? Well, I'm delighted to be here because what I love to talk about is success. Everybody wants a chance to be successful. And I think a critical piece of connecting to success right now is connecting to the one voice that matters most in business, the voice of your customer. I've been fortunate to spend my career connecting with customers in sales and sales leadership, and also as a partner experience and customer experience leader. And what I'm so excited about with the time that we're living in now is the opportunity to change the game, to change the conversation with our customers and to look in a new direction of success together. I love that. That's so much passion right there. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Um, Karen, so we like to start off our episodes with a little uh, CX pitch, a little sales pitch. And I know that you have a little sales, sales background in there. So um, I'm expecting big things from you, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a hypothetical. And then in a 30 second elevator pitch, I want you to tell me what you would do in that scenario. So imagine I'm the head of CX at company. X, and I'm struggling to convince the board about the customer-centric direction of the company. What do we do? So in the 30-second elevator pitch, I want you to tell me, what would you do in that scenario? Now, let me start the timer. Ready? Go. Hello, everyone. Welcome today to our customer experience alignment meeting. I'm glad you're all here as your head of customer experience. And I wanted to let you know that I will be willing to give you this meeting time back today. And all you have to do is answer one question for me. I'd like each one of you on the board sitting here to pick up a post-it note or a piece of paper and write down the answer to this one question. And after you write the response, hold it up to the camera so we can all see it. And here's the question. What is our customer experience strategy? And then you pause, you let them write it down, hold it up to the camera and you know what you'll discover? No two people will give you the same definition. And therein lies the start of a meaningful conversation to bring your organization back into alignment. I love that. The, the timer went off, but, but you just kept going. I love it. Amazing. So um, Karen, tell me this, what makes you great at CX? I love stories. You know, at the heart of my career is I love to hear people's stories about success, hear stories about people's struggles, and have the opportunity to create a path forward together. And that has shown up in being able to do sales and sales leadership, that's shown up in this world of experience, and it now shows up in this world of thought leadership. I think when we ask great questions, we invite people to have a conversation and to share their stories. And for me, you know, things like surveys and data have always been an opportunity to tune into a signal, to ask a question, to open up a conversation that becomes a story. Because what I found is inside of organizations, stories are what capture our hearts and prompt us to take action so that we can go solve things and mobilize the resources of our company to help our customers. I love that. You, you mentioned the importance of a story there, right? How important is it for a business to tell a story to its customers, but also internally? Critically important. And what's so interesting is throughout my career, and some of the people watching may have been there before too, or they're there right now. I, I've worked with my team to create wonderful surveys and quantitative tools and spent a lot of time analyzing the results and going right. into presentation with all kinds of data, beautiful data, well-organized data, well-presented data, only to be met with the response. Well, I'm not sure we surveyed enough people or listened to enough people. I mean, who's in the sample set? Does this, right. is this really who we need to hear from? Is this our buyer? Is this our influencer? And what's so interesting to me is the same executive that will question my quantitative survey data mm -hmm. is the same executive who will come to me after having had one customer conversation and let me know what customers care about. And here's what I mean by that. Data is important. You know, we want to make sure in organizations that we understand our data, mm -hmm. we have access to our data, and that data is driving some of our decisions. At the end of the day, one 
story, one well-told, well-crafted story will get more buy-in than all of the data points in the world. Because what those stories enable us to do is to see the human on the other side of the data, to connect deeply with the people that we are trying to serve. And that's when we feel a connection to customer experience. And obviously the story ties into the very purpose statement of a company, right? That's something that, that I know you're, you're very good at. So talk to me, what is a purpose statement and what is the importance of it? I've been doing some work with companies large and small around the world who are pausing long enough to ask what I call the big impact question mm -hmm. in service of maybe redefining or reconnecting with their organization's sense of purpose. Right. And the big impact question is who is our customer now? For lots of organizations that has shifted. You know, it shifted because of profitability. It shifted because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It shifted because some organizations are seeing new possibilities. You know, there's maybe a new way to win. And within that, you know, when you shift your definition of your customer, it's critical to shift your purpose statement as well. Yeah. And I'll give you two examples that I've been involved with recently. One is a large organization that makes chemicals for farmers. And they changed their definition from the distributor, you know, kind of the people that get those chemicals to the farmers, to the actual farmer. And so within that, they changed their purpose statement to be weed-free fields. Love that. Now, another example, yeah, another example, healthcare organization. And they were trying to make the shift from reinforcing the doctor as, as their customer to mm -hmm. the patient as their customer. And their new tagline became, the patient will see you now. And within that, you know, that, that critical purpose statement, I mean, who likes to sit in the waiting room at a doctor's office? No one, no one trust people, me. <laughs> right, or in person with those like old outdated magazines. You're like, who reads this? What's a magazine? This is crazy. Right. And so what, what shows up for me though, within that purpose statement and how customer experience can be linked to a mm -hmm. purpose statement and aligned to everyone's job is this. In that statement, for example, let's take weed free fields. It tells us very simply and easily who we serve, why we serve, and the greatest good we're trying to deliver with that service. And I think that's so powerful because if I worked in that company, no matter what job I did, I could see what I'm doing in that sense of purpose. I could understand who I serve, why I serve, and the greatest good I can help to deliver. And so those statements don't have to be a paragraph long, right? I was able to recite those to you because they're easy to remember, but yeah. the heart like of that, yeah. yeah, the customer, the heart of that is the customer. I love those stories because they're, they're so simple in the way that you can explain it to someone, right? It's just three words and that is the purpose statement. And that's a purpose statement gone right. Now, what about the flip side? Where do you see purpose statements go wrong? Purpose statements go wrong when they're about how the company will get to success rather than how the customer will get to success. Right. And, you know, I've seen organizations actually, you know, somehow work that into their purpose statement or their mission statement or into their values. And, you know, what starts to happen is when what you're prioritizing is, is company success, your customers mm -hmm. feel that and they feel lost. And it sends an unintentional signal that you're sort of out for success and gain on your terms, yeah. as yeah. opposed to how you can be of service and create success for your customers, which is ultimately the basis of the best and most loyal customer relationships. You know, we create success and win together. Yeah, of course. And it's a process of testing and iterating that, right? Yes. Um, now, I wanted to shift to, towards Salesforce a little bit as well. And uh, I was very curious, is there kind of a well-renowned customer story that everyone knows and relies on at Salesforce that underpins how you guys approach CX? CX at Salesforce is actually embedded into our core values, you know, which includes some other core values like trust and equality. And mm -hmm. one of our other values is customer success. And, you know, we think and operate through the lens of how to enable our customers to be successful, yeah. you know, to give them accesses, access to the, the people, products and resources to make that happen. And we feel strongly that that starts with deep understanding, deep listening and having a beginner's mind, mm -hmm. right? Really forgetting everything that we think we know so that we can be fully present in a moment when a customer is sending us a signal about what they need, whether that signal is coming from a survey, a support interaction, a customer advisory board, or in some kind of a one-to-one -one interaction. So 
looking at that, obviously, because Salesforce has been, you know, one of the pioneers of CX and, and customer success in, this, in the way that it approaches it, a lot of companies out there look up to it. So from your standpoint, looking at technology as well, what are the biggest uh, changes that you have seen companies make to their CX programs over the past five years or so? The biggest changes I see companies making are two things. First of all, being able to aggregate more signals, right? So bring more of the ways that customers talk to us together right. and use tools like artificial intelligence to not only interpret what that signal means, but to recommend some next best actions mm -hmm. that you could take individually or collectively based on, on that signal. Right. So, you know, I think about it as being able to hear your customers as one voice in the many different ways that they're talking to you. And then once you hear that information, really engage the power of tools, not only just to put it in one place and do sophisticated analysis, yep. but also to to recommend some actions to take, because I mean, I don't know about you. I've been in these situations before where I, I give what I think is a, a wonderfully compelling presentation to executives right. about the voice of the customer. And at the end, they're like, and they don't use these exact words. They use them much more nicely than I'm going to say them. But but the heart of what the message is, is I don't know what to do with this information. Right. I mean, what's I'm next? Glad what's to next? It, but, <laughs> right. But like, now what? Now what? And so I think that tools can help us get mm -hmm. to the now what in a relatable way. Interesting. That's, that's funny because you answered my next question as well. And that was going to be what type of technology do you think is going to be the most important in CX? And you're saying AI and predictive analysis. I think that's a big piece of it. I think, you know, the other aspect that's really important is being able to get the data from your customers in one place and mm -hmm. organize it in a way so that you can look for those those bigger signals and, and have a strength, you know, behind that signal. So, you know, you're right. listening to the right one. Any, uh, I'm just curious, any tools that, that um, pop up to the top of your mind when it comes to predictive analysis? Well, naturally, I think about Salesforce Einstein <laughs> because that's what, that's what we do. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it, you know, I don't think it's as much all the time about jumping to the tool because you know, I think about these times where you, know, you see people doing a home improvement project right. and it's only thing that you have is a hammer in your toolbox, everything looks like a nail, right? I mean, can you accomplish every home improvement task with a hammer? No. I love right? that metaphor. <laughs> yeah, you have to have the right tool for the job. And I think that starts with understanding, you know, the purpose of that tool. You know, what is the outcome you're hoping that tool is going to deliver? You know, yep. when you apply digital tools to your customer experience strategy, how are you trying to make your life better for your customers with that tool? So mm -hmm. I like to think of it as like people before process, process before tool, because at the end of the day, what that tool is going to try to do is automate your workflow, yep. right? And, and depending on those, the answers to those upfront questions, right? About who your customer is and how you're serving and mm -hmm. how you plan to use the information you're gathering, it will inform the strategy about the right tool for the job for you. Right. And so it's still like you mentioned, you know, people, culture, and tools, of course, all playing a very crucial role. Um, and at the same time, they can be the inhibitors, can't they? Because you can have the faulty tool in that, in that uh, entire scenario and you know everything falls apart right what are some of the biggest inhibitors that you've seen when helping companies push for that customer centric growth <laughs> tools are a wonderful way to uh, make bad data move more quickly through the organization and also to automate our own bias right so if what i'm listening for is you know a single signal from a customer because mm -hmm. i believe that's the best indicator of our customer loyalty or the health of our customer relationships. Yeah. And then I put a bunch of tools on top of that. I can take a very limited view of customer health and propagate it to you very quickly. And in the process, create lots and lots of signals that I'm missing. I can create blind spots at speed and scale. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what happens is tools get us focused on a single narrow path and we start trying to optimize, you know, these answers without ever stopping back to say, are we asking the right questions? Because see, these tools are designed to help you deal with the answers to the questions you ask. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily designed to help you come up with better questions. Yeah, no, exactly. That's exactly it, isn't it? Because there's no, you need to be able to ask a perfect question first and then have your tool validate that. Whereas in predictive, predictive tools, you get the data and then you almost have to act on it and give that extra layer of uh, support to it. Um, 
So you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, noise in general and using tools and, and, and things of that nature. I know that in your new book, uh, Listen Up, you talk a lot about turning down the noise. What, what does that mean? You have to turn down the noise of everything around you so you can hear the voice of your customer clearly. And I will tell you the, the loudest noise that interferes with our ability to hear our customers is one word, one signal that sort of trumps the voice of the customer more often than not, that's prevalent in lots of organizations. Ego. So here's what happens. We think we know what our customers want, or we fall in love with our own positive feedback to the degree that our ego gets in the way of hearing the signal that the customer is clearly sending to us. Interesting. And how do you, um, over the, over the years, working with companies and, and kind of diminishing their ego and really focusing on the customer, what are some of the interesting insights that you pulled in terms of both successes and failures? This is where stories show up in a very powerful way. Something happens that's very different when I play a recording of a customer service interaction for a senior executive and they get to hear that customer in the moment of struggle and frustration, oh. <laughs> a problem that doesn't get solved. I mean, executives will take off their glasses, pound on the table. That's so and, cool. That's so cool. I love it. <laughs> right. And in that moment, you connect to the humanity in the pain of that moment. And it shows up in a real way that the experience that you intend, you know, your stated experience is not your customer's lived experience. Right. And I find very often literally hearing that voice of the customer prompts even executives who've been wrestling with big egos about that feedback, it prompts them to get curious about what went wrong between the customer experience that we intend and the mm -hmm. customer experience that's actually showing up for the customer. I love that. Let's jump into our quick fire five question round as well. It's a, mix, a mix of personal, professional questions. So uh, I'll give you five questions. Answer quick, as quickly as you can. First and foremost, favorite example of CX outside of your industry? <laughs> uh, Yelp. Because it's crowdsourced, because there's comments and data, uh, and because it's something that people gravitate to as a source of feedback that prompts them to take action. I love it. That's the first. No one's mentioned Yelp, believe it or not. What's your biggest pet peeve with CX as a business discipline? The net promoter score. Oh, uh, no way. <laughs> Tell me more. I'm curious now. <laughs> there's this guy that I find so fascinating. Uh, his, his name is Ashley, and he's kind of a guy next door. And one day he was out like having a drink at the pub with the friends, obviously pre-pandemic. And he was kind of doing a little conjecture of like, how could we make life more exciting? And so he pitched out to his friends the idea that he would fly to Las Vegas where there's lots of casinos and he would bet his life savings on the spin of one time around on the roulette wheel. And they all kind of laugh and, you know, they're coming up with these hypothetical scenarios. And so he leaves the pub. And when he gets home, he starts thinking, I think I'm going to do this. First thing he does is he checks his savings account. Then he sells his watch, his car, his golf clubs. He eventually ends up selling all of his possessions. He flies to Las Vegas with his friends from the UK wearing a rented tuxedo because that is essentially all he has at that point. <laughs> he takes his literal life savings and goes to the cashier gets that back in chips, walks to the roulette table, and the croupier explains to him, you know, when the ball starts spinning on the wheel, you know, you make your selection and that's it. He put his whole life savings on a single spin of the wheel on one number. Now, if Ashley were your friend, would you tell Ashley that that is a great bet? No. I'm sorry, and, Ashley. I'm sorry, Ashley. <laughs> no, I know. Regardless of the outcome of that spin, okay, win or lose, could you detect a playbook that is predictable and repeatable to guarantee that you know how to tell Ashley if he spins again or anyone else, whether they'll win or lose? Absolutely not. That's net promoter score. See, every single day we go all in in our businesses on one number. We gamble everything on one number. We go all in, we go big. A single signal is effectively false. And part of the challenge is, when that, when that number hits, that net promoter score number, very few companies can articulate to me, when you win, why did you win? When you lose, why do you lose? And what's the playbook to guarantee the outcome? So I guess my question to you is, are you willing to bet your business on a single number? I'm just going to give it a second. Just, just, just let it pause. <laughs> 
Love it. I couldn't help myself. I knew, I know this is a quick fire round, but I just had to ask. Okay. Third question. What is one of the biggest CX myths out there? The net promoter score is indicative of customer loyalty and future buying behavior. Who is the most inspirational leader you have ever worked with? Patty Hatter. She's currently the senior vice president of global customer support services at Palo Alto Networks. Amazing. Shout out, Hattie. <laughs> <laughs> What's the one book you would recommend to the audience and why? It doesn't have to be CX related. Well, naturally, I would recommend my own three books that I've written. But outside of that, I would recommend a book called Life Scale by the author Brian Solis. And the reason is he talks about how to minimize distraction so that you can focus on creating and doing your best work. And, you know, his hypothesis is that we've trained our brains to get very distracted and jump from task to task. Mm -hmm. And he advocates a model that I use myself, uh, which is working kind of in 90 minute distraction free sprints and, you know, using that as a tool for greater concentration and focus to do your best work. And then you give yourself a reward at the end of the 90 minutes and decide if you want to do another sprint. I find it to be highly effective. And it's how I've been able to do things like write the working from home book in 30 days. 30 days. 30 days. Jeez. I love that. That's, that's dedication right there. Um, Karen, let's, let's jump into your story as well and how you got to where you got to right now. Um, first and foremost, I know that you've been, you've been in the industry for a while now, but how have you been able to identify those opportunities to grow your CX responsibilities within your company, right? Because to a lot of our listeners, that might be a predicament that they find themselves in right now. Mm, I'll, I'll never forget the time that it was my first job and it was the end of the day on a Friday and my boss called me into his office and I had the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach that I was about to be fired. Like, it was like, you're in school and you just got called to the principal's office at the end of the day, nothing good happens now. Of course. And I sat down in his office and he kind of like walks in unceremoniously with like this cup of tea and he's like peering <laughs> over his glasses and I'm trying not to completely freak out. And at that point I was a project manager uh, supporting salespeople. Yeah. And so he pauses and he looks at me and he says, Don's retiring. And I'm like, who is Don and why do I care? You're probably your same two questions. And he says, well, we want you to take over his customers because he was a salesperson. Just watch these customers uh, until we can hire a salesperson, you know, yeah. full time. But keep doing your other job. And he says, it's called the star module. So all I hear is, I'm going to be a star. That's it. <laughs> There's 100 customers in the star module. I came to discover that star actually stood for like small, troubled, and risky. These are like 100 of the worst customers <laughs> ever. Uh, I mean, ever. So I call 100 customers. How many of them do you think agree to meet with me out of 100? Mm, let's, let's go with 10. <laughs> what? Okay, so I'm so excited to meet the one customer right? that's going to make me a star. So I put on my best suit. I would like to say that that was my interview suit. Mm -hmm. And I drive to this office park that is really scary. Okay, possibly scene of a horror film. Go inside. It's like I finally get called into the conference room. It's like the rickety chairs, nothing matches. And I pull out a folder and I hand each person sitting there a printed proposal. And then I read it to them word for word. And I won the deal. How is that possible? I mean, it wasn't because I had a great pitch. I definitely did not have a great suit. Here's why. I literally had a beginner's mind. I, I had one customer who was willing to meet with me. So I asked a lot of questions. I did research. And the only part of that proposal template I had downloaded that I had like customized the yeah. fill in blank section was the problems the customers were trying to solve, mm -hmm. the outcomes that they would realize, and how our solution would help them get there. It wasn't because my pitch was great. It was because I asked great questions and then I used that information. It took further into my sales career and losing a couple deals when I thought I knew it all yeah. to really understand the power of connecting to your customer with questions, listening as if you have no idea what the answer might be, and then getting curious about how you could win together. And over time, you know, that became 
working with bigger customers, asking some different questions, then leading teams and teaching them how to do that. And I ultimately hit a point in my career where I thought, okay, I could keep going on this sales journey. I mean, there's certainly a career path there. And I thought, what else could I do? I mean, how could I use these customer skills in a different context Mm -hmm. and maybe learn something new? And so I started doing networking inside of my own company. And I would sort of ask that question. How could I use my customer skills in a new context while learning something else? And I was fortunate that along the way, I met the boss who connected me uh, with Patty, who I talked about earlier when we were Mm -hmm. both at a different company. And the whole basis of what she was doing was this work around experience. And the, I, the idea was we could use your customer facing skills, you know, about how, how our go-to-market model works and what's working and what's not working in that sense. Yep. And then what you're going to learn is operations and strategy. Like, how do we fix this so that we can do more and better for our customers? And so we all know throughout this huge organization who our customers are and what they care about. And so that for me was being able to take a skill and use it in a different context. And that opened up for me this whole world of customer experience. What I would say at its core, though, is the brilliance of customer experience, you know, as a profession is Mm -hmm. it teaches you to ask great questions, get deeply curious about the answers and turn what you hear into stories that that inspire action that get to results. I love that. It's, it's, it's a combination of so many things, isn't it? Uh, curiosity, being able to ask good questions, being, being able to leverage what you already have and then turn that into a different scenario, right? I love, I love that story. All right, with that, we can wrap up. Karen, thank you so much for joining and sharing your insights with our audience. A real, real pleasure to have you on the show. To everyone else, thank you for tuning in throughout season one. And if you like what CXLs brings to the table, shoot us a follow on LinkedIn and get ready for season two. Till next time.